Hare Krishna. So today we continue our discussion on the Bhagavad Gita. Today I'll be discussing on the topic of how we can understand the nature of spirituality. So I'll be sharing a PowerPoint now. And if any time the PowerPoint is not visible while I'm speaking, please let me know through a message and I will change it immediately. So today I'll be speaking on 229 in the Bhagavad Gita. We'll be discussing these three questions. What is spirituality? Is it a state of mind? And why are so few people spiritually minded? Within this, what I'll be discussing primarily is that clarifying our conceptions of spirituality. We are going more or less sequentially in terms of the Bhagavad Gita. And while going through sequentially, selecting the key verses, we are also trying to develop the concept, concepts that are taught in the Bhagavad Gita. So in the first session, we discussed about what is the right thing to do? That is the defining driving question of the Bhagavad Gita. The second session was about how the question of activity rests on the question of identity. I need to understand who I am by which we will be able to move forward and decide what to do. Then I discussed about the nature of the soul and transmigration and reincarnation and the scientific rationale for that and what determines our next life. Then in the last session I discussed how does this apply in terms of the departure of a loved one and how do we deal with grief. So today we will talk about moving forward that how can once we decide okay there's a soul and there's a spiritual side of life. So today also in the world there's a lot that goes on in the name of spirituality. So what exactly is spirituality uh, based on logic as well as Bhagavad Gita? So the verse we'll be discussing is 2.29 today. Ascharyavad pashyati kashchidenam Ascharyavad vadati tathai vachanya Ascharyavad chainam anya shunhoti Shutvapenam vedana chaiva kashchet That Ascharyavad pashyati kashchidenam that some people see the soul as astonishing, amazing. Others see it, uh, they speak about it as amazing. Others, still others, hear about it as amazing. And still others, hear about it and still they don't understand. What this means is that different people perceive the soul differently. So some people consider the idea of the soul illuminating and others consider it befuddling. So we won't go into the specific broad aspects of the four categories. The four categories basically talk about people with four different levels of spiritual orientation. Those who have directly realized and are perceiving the soul of the spiritual vision, they find it marvelous. They find it amazing. Then there are others who have understood it and who are speaking about it so that they can get greater awareness and they can share greater awareness among others also. So we look at how the soul is seen, soul is awareness is spread, soul is understood and the soul is not understood. And all this is amazing because the relationship people have with their own spiritual side varies from person to person. So let's go back to the slide here. And... We look at the word spirituality as it is used today and based on the Bhagavad Gita also, we can say that it can have three distinct meanings. One is that it is a state of mind. The second is it's a level of reality. And third is it's a process for attaining the state of mind and the level of reality. This means, let's look at this. So the first meaning of spirituality as a state of mind. That means that some people feel that, oh, if I go to a particular place, it makes me feel calm. It makes me feel 
joyful it makes me feel a sense of self acceptance it makes me feel great grateful and all this they consider is spiritual so anything that makes them feel this way they call it spiritual now it can be spiritual but it is not automatically spiritual so i was talking about spirituality as a state of mind and most people who practice who are spiritual who consider themselves spiritual or who explore spirituality they are basically looking for this state of mind and <clears throat> nowadays we have had enormous technological progress which has brought about a lot of physical comforts in the world outside but somehow there is a lot of psychological discomfort people are dis- disturbed and distressed and they need some relief so anything that helps them feel calm and composed that is what they call as spiritual and they all try in various ways to get that calmness of mind so now why is it that this well if i got a message that you can't hear i'm not sure whether others okay thank you so now why is it that this idea of spiritual has become a little confusing now what what do we mean by spiritual I would like to explain based on a diagram so here i hope this figure is visible to everyone the bhagavad gita explains that there are three levels of reality that the physical the mental and the spiritual and so there's the body the mind and the soul now among these if we consider the bhagavad gita holds that the physical and the mental both are actually material so the body is like the soft like the hardware and the mind is like the software and the soul is the user so basically the soul or the spiritual level of reality is different from the mind also so the mind is subtle and it can't be easily perceived and that's why it's often considered to be uh, also something higher so here if you consider there is the physical mental and spiritual and in the non physical anything beyond the physical level there are two levels there's the mental and the spiritual so for most people the the normal comforts of life address the physical level of reality and anything that does not address the physical level of reality they consider it to be spiritual and that's how the mental and the spiritual get conflated together the mental and spiritual are both considered to be more or less spiritual because both of them are non perceivable by physical means and because they are non perceivable physical means so they think okay whatever is higher whatever is unknown what is non perceivable that must be spiritual so essentially the mental and the spiritual are conflated together and considered to be spiritual and that's why when people talk about spirituality as a state of mind what they are they are actually not being sp- spiritual they are being mental so now if we just go to a close place to nature and we feel calm and composed and we feel more at ease with ourselves more at peace with ourselves now that is good at the same time that is not spiritual necessarily it could be it depends on what we are thinking about and what we are not thinking about so to go back to the slide basically i talked about three things now so what is spirituality as the level of reality talk about spiritual state of mind spiritual is level of reality level of reality means that there is a material level and there is a spiritual level and krishna has talked about this earlier also in the bhagavad gita in 9 in 216 नासतो विद्यते भावो न भावो विद्यते सतः उभयोरपि दृष्टोंतस त्वनयोस्तत्तु दर्शिभि इ सेड दैट ऑफ द 
material there is no endurance and of the spiritual there is no change and this is ubhayor api drishtant drishto antas those who have seen reality to its end they understand that reality has these two categories ubhayor to anayo sattva darshi bhi they are the seers of truth so there is a material level of reality and there is a spiritual level of reality so we could say that that if you consider a mountain there is a bottom of the mountain which is material consciousness and there is a top of the mountain that is spiritual consciousness and if we move, move from the material level to the spiritual level then whatever enables us to rise up from material consciousness to spiritual consciousness that process is also called as spirituality so spirituality basically has three distinct meanings one is that it is it is a state of mind second is a level of reality and third is it is a process for rising to a higher level of consciousness so the bhagavad gita is very clear that the spiritual is another level of reality and that the soul is a concrete entity the soul is not physical but that doesn't mean mean it is abstract the soul is a is a is a concrete thing it's not a physical thing it is a thing which is present in the region of the heart and from there the soul radiates out consciousness and when the soul radiates out consciousness in this way that con- so the soul is here the mind is here the body is here the soul's consciousness comes out from the mind through the body and to the outer world now when the soul's consciousness the soul is here the mind is here the body is here and the soul's consciousness comes out through the mind to the body and to the this is a physical it's come to the physical level now at the physical level there are many objects which agitate the consciousness they may agitate because they threaten us or they may agitate because they tempt us either way when they agitate us that makes us peaceless that makes us restless and we need some relief from that agitation so although mo- modern society and its progress have made the physical level more comfortable in terms of providing us the needs of life today we don't have to worry a lot about where we'll get drinking water or whether the temperature that we are going to face each day will be in a reasonably comfortable range we the technology is taking care of those things so the physical level we have more comforts but at the physical level we also have more agitation it is through technology we get news of distresses all over the world through technology we get new we get exposed to temptations from all over the world and now this is not to blame technology this is simply to analyze the uh, consciousness of what is happening today so the consciousness when it comes to the physical level it gets agitated in today's world and it needs some relief so when anybody can actually get the consciousness to the level of the mind and calm it down then that those people are considered to be spiritual so now that is fine we all want peace of mind but there are different ways of getting this peace of mind so when 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 we reduce spirituality only to exploring the mental level then essentially what are we doing uh we are caught at the material level of consciousness and krishna says that actually rising to genuine spirituality is very rare because we have material attachments manushyanam sahasreshu kashchid iti siddhaye etatam api siddhanam kashchin mam vet tatvatah very few people actually endeavor to know the spiritual reality the seven three in the bhagavad gita so they can't perceive anything beyond the material i discussed this slide so now we consider the non physical level has two components there is the mental and the spiritual level and most of what it goes on in the name of spirituality is like a painkiller and it pacifies us 
Whereas when we address the spiritual level, when we practice processes that raise our consciousness to the spiritual level, that is like the curative medicine. It's not just a painkiller. It's not just an analgesic. It's an antiseptic. And it purifies us. So let me talk a little bit more about these two differences that there is pacification and there is purification. Pacification means that, say, there is some kind of agitation within us Maybe we, we may be agitated because of anger or envy or anxiety, whatever it is. And then that is an uncomfortable situation to be in. And then gradually, somehow, that agitating emotion goes down and we feel peaceful. That is pacification. However, purification means it's not just how we feel, but it's about what makes us feel the way we feel? Now we may say, what makes me feel is the world. And it's the world's events. So if people speak harshly to me, I get angry. Or if I see some tempting object, I start developing a craving for them. But it's not that simple. If we consider that, say, there are two people, who one of them, both of them live here and work here. And they pass by a road to go to work. And on the workplace, on the road, there's a bar. Now, one of them is a regular alcoholic. The other is a teetotaler who's never drunk alcohol. So now the person who's an alcoholic, when they pass by, immediately the desire comes. Oh, I want to drink. I want to drink. I want to drink. And for the other person, there is no desire. So now, so the, the agitation, has it come just because there's a bar outside? No, agitation has come because there are impressions inside, there are impurities inside. Because of the repeated choices of that person in the past, that desire for, that craving for alcohol is already present and then that pops up. So, pacification means the desire is not manifest. The, the cause of agitation is no longer, is not, is not there and that's why the agitation is not there, the external cause. But as soon as the external cause comes up, the agitation comes up. So pacification simply means that presently the agitating emotions are not there. Purification means the inner impurities, the inner impressions that, that make us vulnerable to being agitated, they are removed. So much of what goes on in the name of spirituality is pacification of the mind. And it is helpful in its own way. When the mind is agitated, if we can, could calm it down, then that can help us to function better. But that alone is not all that we need or seek. Because the situations around us change. And if our emotions are dependent on our situations, uh, usually dependent on our situations, then we will always be at the mercy of our situations. We will live very vulnerable lives. We will be tossed about like tiny twigs in a stormy ocean. Each wave that comes, it will agitate us. So there are a lot of agitative ways in the world today. And that's why our minds are agitated. But the solution is not just trying to change what we perceive and calm yourself down. So most of most of what, what goes on in the name of spirituality, it changes the object of perception. So for example, some people might just go to a natural retreat place and feel peaceful. Some other people might just close their eyes and try to perceive, try to visualize a nice natural scene. And some people offer guided meditations where people are told, imagine, a uh, particular place actually about 20 more than 25 years ago about, about when I was introduced first to uh, before I was introduced to the Bhagavad Gita and Bhakti practices I also was exploring spirituality in various ways so I was at a workshop where uh, I was led on a guided meditation and the teacher told relax Take deep breaths. Sense as your breath comes in and out. Comes in and out. Slow it down. Now imagine that you are sitting on the banks of an 
river. The river water is flowing in front of you. On the opposite side, you can see a giant mountain. Clouds are touching the peak of that mountain. And mist is forming around the top. A cooling breeze is blowing from that mountain across the river to you. You can feel the breeze whistling by through your ears. You can feel the freshness of the air as it touches your face. You're feeling calm, you're feeling relaxed. You're at peace with yourself. Now as this was going on, we were all feeling peaceful. And suddenly, there was a bang, an explosion. Apparently there was a car crash outside the meditation place where we were having meditation. And there was chaos. So what happened? We were feeling peaceful, but the next moment we started feeling agitated. So at that time I started thinking, this is good. I was feeling peaceful. But what was being done primarily was that when the objects that of perception were agitating through what was considered to be spiritual, the objects of perception were changed. And when we started, now objects of perception can be what we physically see or what we visualize. Either way, by changing the objects of perception, we were brought some peace. Now there are other methods where people may be told, look at a, keep a candle in front of you and look at it. Or keep some, uh, keep some kind of uh, enigmatic picture or puzzle or whatever. People can be given different objects for focus. And that's how, when that object is no longer agitating, in the sense that the world is agitating, we feel peace, we feel peaceful. And that is pacification of the mind. Now why is pacification of mind compared to a painkiller? As I mentioned here, it's a painkiller. Why? Because well, if suppose somebody has sickness and they are in pain because of the sickness. Then if they are given a painkiller, they feel relief. In fact, they feel immediate relief. Often, if they are given a curative medicine, say an anti antibiotic, they may not feel anywhere near the same relief that they felt on taking that painkiller. So, the painkiller works faster, but it also works shorter. The effect stays for a very short time. And actually, even the effect is not so much curing, but covering. So the pain is there, it's just that our nervous sensations, our the, the painkiller interferes or impedes our systems for perception, our nervous sensations, so that we don't sense the pain. So similarly, what is happening with respect to this, uh, what is mostly called as spirituality is that the object of perception is being changed and then we feel a little peaceful about ourselves. However, what needs change is the inner impressions that make us tend to perceive certain objects. So, an alcoholic may feel peaceful by going away from a bar, which is fine as far as it goes. It's not advisable for an alcoholic to live near a bar or live next to a bar, especially if they want to become free from alcohol. But you cannot live in a world which is free from temptations. And we basically get lose our peace of mind by two things. One is temptation, the other is tribulation. One is the promise of pleasure and the other is the fear of trouble. And the world is such that it is filled with promises of pleasure and it is filled with fears of trouble. And if we just change our object of perception uh, and think that that is what is going to make me peaceful, well that may, but only temporarily. What we need is that the impressions within us which direct our consciousness in certain ways, that needs to change. And so there is the physical reality, there is the mental reality, there is the spiritual reality. So purification means that we don't just change 
when purification is happening at that time basically the object when purification is happening the object goes here and there here and there and when that happens the from the normally the object which we are perceiving there are various material objects that we are perceiving but when we become spiritually minded at that time we start perceiving different objects various spiritual objects and ultimately we become attracted to them so once we understand that there is a soul and this the soul is not just the source of consciousness the soul is also meant to be the object of consciousness that means the soul is not only going to perceive but we need to perceive the spiritual reality also and spirituality means when our consciousness by default gets sheltered at the spiritual level that is when we are actually becoming spiritual i repeat this that spirituality when when do we actually become spiritual or what does becoming spiritual mean that means the default home of our consciousness is the spiritual level of reality what what do we mean by the home of our consciousness just like when we have no work to do we return to our home the home is the place where we normally stay where we feel comfortable where we feel peaceful safe so we say be at home that means be comfortable be peaceful be safe. feel safe here so, so now similarly our consciousness has a home and to know what that home is we can simply check what do we think of when we have nothing to think of what do we think of when we have nothing to think of and to the extent we we learn to become spiritual to that extent the default object of our thoughts becomes spiritual so spiritual means we focus on our essential identity as souls in future sessions we'll talk about how the soul is a part of god and then we focus on the divine and the service to the divine and that's how we become we be, it's important for each one of us to recognize that spirituality is not just the state of mind where i feel peaceful but it is It is a level of reality where my consciousness resides. So we are there is a spiritual level of reality, and when our consciousness resides over there, now from the just as from our home we may go out for various purposes. So similarly, we live in the material world, and we have to perceive various material objects. So that's fine, but as long as our consciousness is sheltered at home in spirituality, in, in the spiritual level, that's when we are spiritual. So. spirituality is not just a state of mind it's a level of reality and it's a process by which our consciousness can rise from its present material level to the spiritual level so the bhagavad gita will outline various processes of spirituality we'll talk about these in future sessions there's karma yoga there's gyan yoga there's bhakti yoga there is there now in today's terminology there's meditation there is prayer there is mindfulness we'll we'll in future sessions talk about these but the essential point is you remember the metaphor of the mountain that now if i go back to the mountain here then if we consider this mountain there can be different ways in which one may go up the mountain we may go up um, from from the left from the right from the front from the back so the different religions the different spiritual practices the different traditions they are like different ways up the mountain the important thing is not just what is my affiliation uh, which particular path i am affiliated with the important thing is that whether i am rising up in a future session we'll talk about the difference between spirituality and religion uh, but right now suffice it to say that any process that helps us to raise our consciousness upward towards the spiritual level that is spirituality so now that brings us to the question why are so few people spiritually minded so the idea is that as i said most people are not in most people are not interested in anything apart from the immediate we are all innately pleasure seeking and if pleasure is available at the physical level then we get consumed by that desire and we don't think of anything higher and 
even somebody who thinks of something higher, most people who, who want to be spiritual, basically they want a painkiller so that they can continue to be materialistic. The pursuit of worldly pleasures often leads to certain anxiety, agitation, and we need relief from that. So what they, pers what they consider as spirituality is often it's a relief so that they can continue pursuing material life. And that is not a very sustainable way to practice spirituality. Because what is happening over there, our conception of life is not changing. Our, the level of reality where our consciousness resides is not changing. We are simply using spirituality or what we consider as spirituality in double quotes to to continue our materialistic way of living while pacifying ourselves. So because most people are materialistic, they don't even consider about anything higher. And now, because simply the materialistic pursuit of pleasure is causing agitation, there are a lot of people who are seeking relief from that agitation. And then they practice something which they call as spiritual. But that is what? That is simply a painkiller, a relief, which will help them to continue pursuing this material life again. So... To genuinely want to know the spiritual level and to realize the spiritual level, that is tough. That requires effort. Because just like climbing up a mountain, it requires effort. So similarly, not many people are interested in, a, in authentic spirituality when understanding the soul and the spiritual level of reality because they are more concerned with material pleasures and they are more concerned with relief while they are pursuing material pleasures, so that they can continue pursuing those pleasures. The Bhagavad Gita, by categorically differentiating between matter and spirit, enables us all to choose intelligently. Do I want to be spiritual or do I just want some psychological relief that I consider as spiritual? So, in the, so to the extent now, to the last point, before I conclude and then we can have questions, that... Now, is wanting peace of mind bad? Obviously not. We all want peace. We all want joy. We all want sense. We all want positive emotions. And spiritual. when we rise to the spiritual level of reality, also those emotions come. Just like when somebody is sick and in pain, they want relief from pain. And if they become healthy, if they take curative medicines and become healthy, they will get relief from pain. So the more we become spiritual, we will get, our mind will become calm and we will feel more peaceful, with our, at peace with ourselves, we feel more contented with life, we will feel more connected with others, especially those who are also having similar values and purposes as us. But the point is that that is the end. And what painkiller tries to do is, that without going through the curative process, one seeks relief from the pain. Similarly, what so-called spirituality does is, without going through the process of curing ourselves of our impurities, by impurities, what we mean is the things that keep our consciousness captivated at the material level. They are impurities from the spiritual perspective. So, without purifying ourselves of such impurities, if we seek peace alone, then what we are getting is shallow spirituality. It is simply painkillers. Now, we can take painkillers and we can take the curative medicine also. So, within the process of bhakti, within the process of bhakti yoga, which Krishna will eventually recommend, we will talk about how we can do the things that help us become peaceful and joyful. But we don't just do those things alone because that can also keep us restless. We focus on rising to the spiritual level of reality and then peace and joy will automatically follow. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I started by speaking on the theme of three topics. What is spirituality? Uh, is it a state of mind? And why are so few people spiritual? So what is spirituality? I discussed three things. It can be a state of mind, it can be a level of reality and it can be a process for attaining that state of mind and level of reality. The state of mind, I talked today how more and more people with the material progress, are materially comfortable, but also because there is so much anxiety and temptation, uh, so the mind is agitated and we need some relief. The consciousness that comes from the spiritual soul through the mental to the physical level, it gets caught in various agitating stimuli and if you could withdraw it, 
or in the physical world itself we direct it somewhere to a more passive more peaceful object that is what is considered spiritual so visualizing a peaceful place is considered a spiritual thought exercise it may or may not be so it's now anything that pacifies the mind that's considered spiritual because there is a misunderstanding about the levels of reality we talk about the gita says there are three levels of reality physical mental and spiritual now within the men, the mental is also material so material has to categorize physical and mental and the from the physical perspective both the mental and the spiritual are non visible and that's why anything which is non physical is often conflated and called as spiritual so then the difference is the bhagavad gita categorically says that the soul is not just some conception or some metaphor the soul is a concrete reality and there is a spiritual level of reality different from the material level so if you consider the top and bottom of a mountain the the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness the bottom is material consciousness so the process that raises our consciousness from the physical the, from the material to the spiritual level that is that process is called spirituality and it talked about how most people are materialistic that's why they are not interested in spirituality the few who are interested in spiritual uh, uh, who seem to be interested in spirituality often they are interested in calmness so that they can continue their material pursuits then that is shallow spirituality so what is real spirituality when we understand that this the spiritual level of consciousness is our home and that's where our consciousness defaults to when we have nothing to do uh, uh, then that is when we are actually spiritual and how do we get to that spiritual level of consciousness by by purification so pacification comes when we just change the object of perception purification comes when we clean ourselves of the impressions that misdirect our consciousness towards agitating objects of perception so an ideal ideal program should have a combination of both painkiller and uh, man curative medicine if there's only painkiller it may act faster but it lives it acts shorter and thus that is not what is sustainable so when we recognize what is spirituality based on gita's wisdom then we can pursue the path seriously thank you so there are a few questions i'll try to take now one of them one by one so now in bhakti we make krishna our primary object of purification object of perception to pacify our mind now is that right well yes and no in bhakti we we do focus on krishna and there are verses of savai manah krishna pada ravinda your parsi parsi the krishna with your eyes hear krishna with your ears uh, taste krishna with your with your tongue as prasad uh, so there are all these processes by which we bring krishna on the tracks of perception that is true but that is not the only purpose the essence of bhakti is that by repeatedly exposing ourselves to krishna we become attached to krishna bhakti is not just about changing the objects of perception it is about changing our attachments mai asakta manaha krishna says in 71 in the bhagavad gita that the process that he is going to tell him tell arjuna the purpose of it is to make the mind attached now yes the objects of perception do affect us and if we could spiritualize the objects of perception that's it's always helpful so in our workplace in our home if we can have more spiritual stimuli around us that can help spiritualize our consciousness but just doing just making our phys- externals more sp- filled with spiritual stimuli uh, that alone is not going to make us spiritual that is a that is a that is a powerful first step but ultimately the essence of bhakti is to make our mind attached to krishna and that attachment will gradually the more we become attached to krishna the more we become cleansed of whatever other attachments that might be there within us so the question from lekha over here how do we know our spirit is pursuit is spiritual or material if the material pursuit is leading to selfless service then does that count as spiritual 
Okay, this is a good question. Three points I would say in this response to this. In terms of the nature of reality, the material and the spiritual are categorically different levels of reality. In terms of mode of functioning, what is spiritual? The beginning of spirituality is lack of self-consciousness. It means I'm not so obsessed with myself. How great I am or how, how small I am. How powerful I am or how powerless I am. Our consciousness becomes free from ourselves and we start living for something bigger than ourselves. So, now the biggest such reality is God. The Bhagavad Gita says that Suhridam Sarva Bhutanam that Krishna is the well-wisher of everyone. So if we focus on Krishna and strive to serve him, then we become fully spiritual. So that, And that we are also fully selfless because Krishna is the well-wisher of everyone. When we serve him, we serve all living beings through him. And thus we become more compassionate, more considerate. And that is the perfection of selflessness. Now in the 12th chapter, Krishna talks about various levels. So if you consider my consciousness is caught in myself, my pleasure, my power, my position, and my consciousness comes out of myself. Now once it comes out of myself, it can go up to various levels. The best is if it goes to the level of Krishna. Now, but once it comes out of myself and goes to some other, some cause bigger than myself, depending on what that cause is, we are on the progressive spiritual path. So Krishna says from 12, 8 to 12, 12 in the Bhagavad Gita, there are various levels you can connect with. The first and the last level he says is an ultimate level actually is that you just become detached from the fruits of your work and work for some cause higher than yourself. So I says Krishna says this is also being on the person does this is also on the progressive spiritual path. So I would say that it will depend on what the particular pursuit is that you are doing. But if it is leading to selfless service, then that is auspicious. Now, the more that selfless service is done in spiritual consciousness, means with our consciousness aware of the multiple ultimate spiritual reality of Krishna and with our consciousness focused in a mood of service to Krishna, then it will become more and more spiritual. Okay. How are the impurities in our mind created in the first place? Is it like the formation of habit? Yes, certainly. Basically, we can say our I said mind is like a software. So if suppose now, now you come for this Bhavita class and you like this class, but say this is the first time you have attended a Gita class, then you may feel hey, I want to know more about the Gita. And then you go on Google and type Bhagavad Gita. But suppose someone who is doing this, say they have visited some other site regularly. Say they have visited Bollywood.com. And now as soon as they type B, the browser will give Bollywood as autocomplete. So now, why has that autocomplete come that way? That's simply their own past choices, which have been saved as preferences, and they come as autocompletes. So when we visit a particular site, it is not just the site that we are visiting, it's also uh, the browser we are creating a record, and that record will prompt us to what that site again. So similarly, whenever we do any actions, they create impressions within us. It's not this action that you do, but the total impression we create. So in the past, either in this life or in previous lives, we have had impure desires. And we have acted on those impure desires, and those actions have created impressions. So habit formation is also similar. We keep doing something repeatedly that becomes, impl that becomes implanted or impressed in our consciousness, and then we end up doing that again and again. So the stronger a habit, the lesser is the thought that we put in to consider whether I should do this or not. It's like the computer gives autocomplete and we just go over there immediately. So the mind gives a proposition based on the past impressions and we immediately accept that proposition. So in the work environment when everybody tries to pull each other down, I feel agitated. Hmm. I know I shouldn't be disturbed, but I'm not very spiritually advanced. So what can I do to keep my consciousness at the spiritual level? Yes, it's a tough situation. Again, the first thing is that you need to know that 
we alone are responsible for our consciousness. That yes, agitating stimuli might be there around us, but the responsibility for our consciousness is primarily ours. It is not the world's. It is not that of our surroundings. So whatever be the surrounding we are in, we need to keep our consciousness calm enough so that we can function and calm enough so that we can gradually orient ourselves towards the spiritual level of reality. So one way to deal with the situation is to have some breaks. Even when we are working in a competitive environment, everybody is en entitled to breaks. During breaks, people you know, gossip, they go to the cafeteria and eat and chit chat, they may surf on the net. So now, instead of doing these activities, we could maybe choose something which specializes our consciousness. We could chant some mantras, recite some verses. We got some striking points from the classes, read the wisdom quotes, and just repeat them once again several times. We could do it once in a few hours on a regular basis. Or we could, we could do it whenever we're agitated. So the idea is that. First, we understand it's my responsibility. Second is that you just saying it's my responsibility, not in the fire to provide my spiritual sources. So I find out what is it that calms our mind and do it regularly. And then once we find when we have this attitude of we are responsible and we are resourceful, then even when disturbance comes around us, we won't be that disturbed. Like waves will come in the ocean, but if we have an anchor, then we won't be that shaken by the waves. So our spirituality can become like an anchor to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level. Okay. So this is Mayan Kumar's question that okay, when we are getting pleasure in serving Guru and Krishna, it becomes difficult for us to do our duties at the material level. Well, that's understandable, but then we need to understand that the, while in analysis, the material and spiritual are separated, in application, they are integrated. So Krishna tells Arjuna to be spiritual, but the Krishna also tells Arjuna to fight a war. Now we could say, in a war, you have to be very much there. The consciousness has to be there, otherwise somebody may shoot us down. So it's not that Arjuna was in a calm, reflective, contemplative mood. So told Arjuna to practice spirituality in a very engaged way in the world. So if we study the Bhagavad Gita properly, we need to expand our conception of what is spiritual. I just say going to the temple, I'm just doing some service given to us by our spiritual authorities. That alone is not spiritual. It's definitely important and it can help us progress on the path towards spirituality, but it is itself not necessarily spiritual, it's withdrawing from the world. So we have times when we withdraw from the world and directly connect with Krishna, and we have times when we withdraw from the direct connection and connect with Krishna indirectly through our work. So we need to come, we need to start perceiving Krishna even in our work, in our family responsibilities. Ultimately. Krishna says, Yataha Pravati Bhutana, Yena Sarvam Vidam Satam Swakarmana Antam Abhyarcha, Siddham Vindati Mahanava Swakarmana Antam Abhyarcha. He's not saying work is worship, but he says that by your work, worship the Lord. Why? Because he says the whole world has come from him. The, the work that we are doing, the situation for that has come from him. The ability that you are working, that come from him. So if we work in a mood of devotion, then what has come from the Lord, we are giving back to the Lord. And that's, that's how we can conceive our work also as spiritual. So we need to, sometimes what happens when we do directly spiritual activities, what we are getting is not so much pleasure. We might be getting pleasure, of course, but it might also be just an escape way from the challenging and burdening nature of material responsibilities. So if you are using as a spirituality as an escape, uh, escape hatch, escape way from the problems of life, then eventually in our spiritual practice also we will face problems. When you face them, then you will have nowhere to go to. So, now,
how can we stay calm in all situations well in all situations not possible it's just like some waves are bigger than some waves and when the bigger waves come it's going to be difficult to keep calm but then the waves will pass and if you hold on to the anchor then the magnitude by which we will be shaken or tossed around will be much lesser so mm. so was dhruv maharaj's prayer to krishna at the material level yes it was at the material level but gradually he became purified so in that's why the operational principle in bhakti is yena kena prakare na mana krishna nivesh somehow or other fix the mind on krishna so when he meditated and he pursued the lord at that time he realized the lord was so attractive that whatever kingdom he was seeking that was no longer that attractive so yes we can get purified by exposure to the lord exposing ourselves to him we can we can soon become purified and we can grow spiritually that way so should we so if we spiritual kamish prajal comes only intermittently so what should we do yes that's understandable because you're not yet fully spiritual so that's why if we are only pleasure seeking in life we will never not be able to sustain ourselves in anything in life we need to be purpose seeking not pleasure seeking this will be a whole session in the future on how living a purposeful life when we are doing something purposeful and meaningful pleasure is a by product of that if we start seeking enjoyment as the primary purpose then we will not be able to sustain ourselves even in material life even if we like to do something say uh, one of my services is writing i like writing but it's not that i like writing all the time sometimes when the thought words i'm not getting the right words my thoughts are not being clear it's it's agony so if i were writing only for pleasure and i would not be able to write also regularly so if we start living our life only for pleasure even the things that give us pleasure we will not be able to do them regularly even material things we will not be able to do regularly so we need to have a purpose and our purpose if you understand is to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level then we can pursue on the spiritual path pursue the spiritual path persevere on the spiritual path even if for some time we don't get pleasure and during our routine material life there are certain things which give us pleasure we don't go out of our way to seek those pleasures but it's not that we go out of our way to avoid those pleasures also say for example if there's good food now if the food is spiritualized by offering to krishna it's not that we have to deliberately avoid good food to become spiritual no but we don't go deliberately out of our way to just seek good food so we focus on the spiritual path and on the while being thus purposeful we can get pleasure and that pleasure is what sustains us while we are moving onward in our life Mm. I'll take two more questions quickly. Mm. Can we sir? Can I serve Krishna by doing my job well and by doing my business? Yes, of course. Now, how our work can be made into worship will be a full session later on. But at this stage, broadly speaking, the idea is that there are two aspects of spirituality. one is world transcending and the other is world transforming the world transcending means that we just take our consciousness away from the world and raise it to the spiritual level and that's important we need to do this periodically otherwise we get too entangled in the world and that is why we have our spiritual practices we have our sadhana we have our satsang we have our swadhyay we, we do our do, do our meditation mantra chanting we do our study of scripture we come for classes like this and then we uh, by all this sad, sadhana swadhyay satsang by all this we are basically world transcending but that's only one aspect of spirituality along with that is also world transforming that means we focus on the spiritual in a way that helps us to grow in our lives that means we focus on contributing 
seeing that it is God, Krishna who has given us our abilities and he wants us to make a make a contribution, do some service. So we, when we have that attitude, so when we give due time for developing our inner connection with Krishna, then we can re-envision our work as an outer contribution to Krishna. And the spirituality can have that connection which involves transcending the world and the contribution which involves we doing our part for transforming the world. So now business can be very consuming and agitating. It can inundate us with materialist consciousness. But then anything can do that in this material world. So if we are cautious enough to make sure that our consciousness doesn't get too materially entangled, so then, yes, we can all work in a way that helps us to grow spiritually. There are many spiritual teachers in India. So are they spiritual or are they offering this peace of mind? Now, it's difficult to go into specifics of any particular teacher. But what we will focus on is the principle. The principle is that what is the effect? Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the Bhagavatam it is said, and it's similar similar thing that I quote in the Bhagavad Gita also, that the result of spirituality is inner contentment and outer detachment. Bhakti pareshanu bhava virakti ranyatracha. The process of bhakti, which is, as we will discuss later, a very powerful spiritual process. What it does is, para isha anubhav. It gives us experience of transcendence. It gives us experience of the divine. Para, who cannot be experienced normally, because he is para, he is transcendental. So when there is para isha anubhav, then what happens by that? Viraktir anyatracha. That experience of the divine is so enriching, so fulfilling, that one doesn't crave for other experiences. One doesn't crave especially for worldly gratifications. So, you know, we can, if you want to know whether a particular teacher is spiritual or not, you can look at their lives and we can look at the lives of their followers. Is it that they are becoming more attached to spiritual reality? Are they becoming detached from worldly indulgences? If they if they talk a lot of good sound good sounding stuff, but they don't actually talk about uh, detaching oneself from worldly pleasures, and their followers just go on with their materialistic way of life, while speaking something which sounds spiritual, hearing something which sounds spiritual, then it may be it may be questionable whether they are actually a uh, being spiritual or not. Having said that, it's uh, best for us. To not be judgmental, we need to be discerning to understand what will help us and what will not help us. But we don't have to be judgmental in condemning anyone. But we just see that, yes, this is what is going to, It's like if I am sick, I want to be cured. Now, is, is am I simply being given a painkiller or am I being given a proper treatment which may involve a combination of painkilling medicine and a curative medicine? So we don't have to, so we need to discern for ourselves. So discernment is done from a platform of humility. You now what is helpful for me, what is not helpful for me. Judgment is done from a platform of pride or arrogance. Now, I know the truth and you are wrong. We don't want to do that. But we need to be discerning so that we can be progressive on our spiritual journey. So thank you very much. The remaining questions, uh, we will save them and we will answer them over the next week or so. And the answers will be there on the um, on the WhatsApp group. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.